All right, so I'm Andrew Krasalski. Today I'm going to talk about how the brain understands music and how music therapy is used to treat various mental illnesses, autism spectrum disorders, Parkinson's disease, and anxiety. All right, first a little bit about me. So I play hockey for my uh, high school. I'm a pianist. I go to Peabody Preparatory School in Baltimore. Uh, yeah, I also live near Baltimore. This is a picture of the Inner Harbor. Okay. So first, music therapy is... Oh, actually, before I jump into this, two things. My mentor was Shailen Clancy, uh, and being a musician did fuel all of this research that you're about to see. So music therapy is bipartite. Uh, first is music, which starts as the brain's perception of sound. Frequency, rhythm, pitch, and tone are all critical aspects of music. Once our brain interprets how those key parts of the sound, um, then the sound transforms into the harmoni harmonious melodies we all know as music. The second component is actual treatment of various mental health issues. By combining both, music therapy helps address patients' physical, emotional, cognitive, and social needs. This presentation will provide a framework to visualize how human minds understand sound and music and the potential that music therapy has shown in treating autism spectrum disorders, Parkinson's disease, and generalized anxiety disorder. All righty. So this section provides a step-by-step -step guide on how the brain processes sound, including sound qualities such as rhythm, pitch, and tone. So when the vocal, instrumental, or mechanical sounds uh, have rhythm, melody, or harmony, uh, there is a result of music. And the human body receives sounds inputs, receives sound inputs via vibrations that create sound waves in the air. The primary mechanism that sees these sound waves uh, or that senses these sound waves is the auditory pathway. So this pathway starts in the ear, which consists of the outer, middle, and inner parts. Sound waves enter the outer ear via the external acoustic meatus, a part of the ear that collects, it's like a collection of sound waves and funnels them uh, into the ear canal. And the ear canal is also called the auditory meatus. Uh, so the sound is amplified and progresses towards something called a tympanic membrane, which commonly just known as an eardrum. Uh, and the eardrum provides a surface for sound collection and it vibrates with frequencies between approximately 20 and 20,000 hertz. Um, and when the eardrum vibrates, three tiny bones in your ear called the malleus, incus, and stapes all vibrate in unison. And these vibrating bones amplify the sound to make sound waves understandable to your brain. Okay. So the stapes transfers the vibrations in the oval window. And this is just a tissue connecting the middle to the middle part of the ear to the inner ear. Um, and it transfers the pressure waves to a fluid filled cavity within the inner ear, which is referred to as the cochlea. And the fluid-filled cochlea is encased in bone, so the liquid does not leak. And once pressure is applied at the oval window, the fluid has nowhere to bulge except uh, the other exit in your ear, which is the round window. And in other words, the round window bulges outward as the stapes moves inward. And as the stapes vibrates at the frequency of the sound arrive arriving at the eardrum, pressure waves travel throughout the cochlea. And these pressure waves in your cochlea disturb something called a basilar membrane. And this supports... Uh, the organ of corti, which is an auditory, uh, it's auditory sensor. And the basilar membrane interacts with the oval window to control something we all know as frequency. And the organ of corti is just a sensory part of your inner ear. And high frequencies uh, have a short wavelength vibrating the basilar membrane more near the oval window. And lower frequency sounds have a longer wavelength vibrating the basilar membrane further from the oval window. And the ultimate purpose of this membrane is that frequency is interpreted as information about position along the basilar membrane. So this interpretation of frequency translates us to understanding um, different frequencies in music. So louder sounds move the basilar membrane more. This is because the amount of movement at a given location depends on the magnitude of force applied by the vibrating stapes, which depends on the sound wave's energy. The vibration of the basilar membrane causes vibration of hair cells in the previously stated cochlea. And these hair cells rest in little rows in, in the organ of corti, that auditory sensory part I was talking about. And a soft sound may stimulate only a couple uh, hair cells in a portion of one row. But as the sound intensity increases, depending on what you're listening to, more hair cells become stimulated and active. In short, the number of hair cells responding in the organ of corti provides information on the intensity of the sound. And vibration of the basilar membrane moves these hair cells against a membrane literally right outside of it, a tectorial membrane. And basically, uh, it depolarizes these, these hair cells. And 
the hair cells are they basically when they're depolarized they stimulate they stimulate a lot of sensory neurons and the cell bodies of these sensory neurons are located at the center of the cochlea in a structure called the spiral ganglion so the spiral ganglion holding sensory neurons then relays information through sound signals from the inner ear to the brainstem from that point data is then carried through something called a cranial nerve eight lying on your brainstem um and the cochlear branch of this nerve by the way um and it carries this data all the way to the medulla oblongata uh, for distribution to other brain centers. Uh, and this is where sound actually starts to be processed into music. Okay. So this is a schematic drawing of the basal membrane of the human cochlea showing the width of it um, and how it increases from the base of the cochlea to its apex. So high frequencies are processed in the basal end of the cochlea and lower frequencies more towards the apex. Uh, and then basically everything I've talked about, you can, you can pretty much visualize here. So at the end, if there's any questions about this, I'm more happy and glad to answer, but I'm going to keep moving. All right. So the cranial nerve eight is the vestibular. Okay. This is a mouthful vestibulocochlear nerve and consists of the vestibular and cochlear nerves, which are generally responsible for balance and hearing. So we're going to focus um, on transmitting auditory signals from the inner ear to the cochlear uh, nuclei within the brainstem. And this is ultimately to the end destination is the primary auditory cortex within your temporal lobe. Um, so basically a quick summary of the auditory pathway. Auditory sensations are carried by the cranial nerve eight cochlear branch, uh, not the balance part, but the cochlear branch to the medulla oblongata the cochlear nuclei. From there, the information is relayed to the inferior colliculus, which is a center that just directs various unconscious motor responses into sounds that we hear. Uh, and the sending acoustic information then goes to a medial geniculate nucleus before being forwarded to the auditory cortex of the temporal lobe. So think of the, medi the medial geniculate nucleus as sort of a middleman there. Uh, so the auditory cortex of the temporal lobe is a significant player in pitch. Uh, high frequency sounds activate one portion of the cortex while low frequency activates another. The auditory cortex contains a map of the organ of cortex. Thus, any information you get there about frequency, anything at all, is translated into information about position on your basilar membrane. Uh, and, and then it's projected. This, all this information is projected onto the auditory cortex, where it's interpreted to produce a person's subjective sensation of pitch. Okay. So moving on regarding uh, rhythm, a research report used fMRI to identify brain areas or to identify brain areas involved in auditory rhythm perception. So the following regions responded to rhythm sequences, uh, the dorsal premortal cortex, SMA, uh, which is just a supplementary motor area, uh, the brain area located in the midline cortex, anterior to the primary motor cortex, uh, pre-SMA and lateral cerebellum. And while rhythm is a significant part of music, tone is also a major player. The auditory cortex in part also recognizes and understands tone, not just frequency. And this part of the brain, along with the cerebellum and prefrontal cortex, also works on analyzing a song's melody and harmony. So if you don't know all these parts, that's okay. The, the main message I'm trying to relay here is that there is so much involved in processing rhythm, pitch, and tone, emotion, and memory. And this is what makes music and the brain such a fascinating combination. With so many sectors of the brain that music is able to affect, music therapy has the potential to cure so many illnesses. Okay, so to visualize what I've talked about a little bit, uh, this is just a map for you all to look at. Uh, so if you need, if you want to screenshot this to follow along a little bit, because uh, I'll be referencing some of these later in the presentation, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'll keep running along. So music therapy, just a little bit definition, history of it. Uh, it's an art-based health profession. Uses it uses music experiences with a therapeutic relationship to really sculpt treatments and tailor treatments uh, to address music therapies. Uh, or music therapy patients, physical, emotional, cognitive, and social needs. Although music therapy is commonly known to be a recent development, the earliest known reference to music therapy appeared in 1789 in an unsigned article in Columbian magazine titled Music Physically Considered. During the 1800s, the first recorded systematic experiment in music therapy took place. A neurologist in New York City, James Leonard Corning, used music to alter dream states of psychotherapy, uh, he believed that during pre-sleep and sleep, cognitive processes became dormant, allowing the penetration of musical vibrations into the subconscious, eliminating morbid thoughts um, that plagued his patients. So in the 20th century, many more music therapy organizations were established, 
Uh, just to name off some of these, 1903, Eva Augusta Vesalius founded the National Society of Music Therapeutics. 1926, Isa Maud Ilson founded the National Association for Music in Hospitals. And this all transcended to the first music therapy college training programs being created in the 1940s. Michigan State University established the first academic program in music therapy uh, 19, in 1944, called the, um, it was the American Music Therapy Association. Uh, and well, this all branched up to the American Music Therapy Association. Now, speaking about the American Music Therapy Association, it was formed in 1998. And it merged the National Association for Music Therapy and the American Association for Music Therapy. So AMTA is officially the largest music therapy association in the United States. And it represents music therapists in over 30 countries around the globe. And although regarded as a recent profession, music therapy has come a very long way. Everything branching from James Leonard Corning's psychotherapy uh, to the father of music therapy, E. Thayer Gaston, and finally to various music therapy college training programs and the respected clinical profession that it's seen today. All righty. We do have to, to wrap up. So last 30 seconds. Got it. So I'm going to move into some benefits of uh, music therapy. So there are benefits of music therapy. These goals are all general benefits um, that can be achieved while staying non-invasive and lacking side effects. Music therapy is unique in its ability to address multiple symptoms at once, all while staying cost effective. For example, receptive music therapy can improve stress and memory at the same time. The ideas behind music therapy is to use music and or elements of music like sound, rhythm, and harmony to accomplish goals like reducing anxiety or caring for other illnesses such as depression. It's also getting easier to access music therapy with a growing number, uh, with a growing number of therapists. Also, a patient would first contact a healthcare provider, then they would contact the music therapist, addressing all their needs, music preferences, and experiences. Then the therapist would then tailor each session specific, specifically to the patient's preferences. They evaluate the patient throughout these sessions, all while working with other healthcare providers to coordinate the patient's care. In terms of illnesses, uh, sadly, I am running a little bit low on time. So I have a research paper that delves into all of these illnesses that it treats. So please check that out if you are more interested in this topic. Thank you very much for your time. Great job. All right, one final question here. Um, what was the most unexpected thing that you learned? Most unexpected thing. For me, I would say walking into this, I thought music therapy was going to be a very prominent health profession uh, dating back way far. Um, but I found out that a lot of developments are very recent. So when doing a lot of my research, it was very hard to find, um, for example, research on depression, you can find a ton of it. But studies on music therapy were very scarce and far between. Um, and it's interesting to see all of the unique ways uh, that it's used in the world today. Gotcha. Hope that increases with your contributions. Thank you very much for your time.